Right, hello and welcome to another great panel discussion. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today we have a fantastic panel assembled to talk about that age-old topic of closing, effective closing. And who doesn't want to learn more about closing? I don't think there's anybody who would claim to have learned everything there is to know. And so I have a fantastic panel lined up today. I have Mark Bandy, I have uh, Andy Paul and Karen Kopp. And rather than me uh, read out bios, I always prefer to, to let the panelists introduce themselves. Now, uh, as attendees, if you have questions, just put them in the chat box or, or feel free to, um, to tweet on our, our Twitter feeds of Pipeliner and SalesPop. All right, well, first of all, Mark, why don't you spend a, spend a couple of moments and introduce yourself to everyone? Hi, I'm Mark Boundy. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you very much. I'm a sales performance consultant that helps organizations sell more, uh, sell at higher value, and price more effectively. Uh, so many sales organizations sell until they make the sale, but don't sell until they make the sale at the right price. And so that's kind of my specialty. Excellent. And Andy? Well, John, thank you for having me back. Um, yeah, so... But gosh, which one should I choose? Uh, <laughs> founder of a, a venture called The Sales House, which is an online sales performance accelerator, uh, author of several books, and a podcaster myself, uh, Accelerate with Andy Paul. Excellent. And Karen? Well, people know me as the chief door opener. I, I'm the CEO and founder of COP Consulting. We are best known for the door opener service where we get our clients the senior level appointments that they so desperately need. Uh, I run a company of senior level door openers who get these doors open for our clients. We also have a trademark process for developing sales language called Moment of Yes. And I'm the author of Biz Dev Done Right, an Amazon bestseller as well as the path to the cash. Excellent. So as I said, uh, a very high-powered panel today, and we'll get straight into it. Um, so, you know, we always know, uh, people love to throw up that old, you know, adage, the ABC, like always be closing. Um, but it does have some truth in it, as, as you should be working through the sales process always towards a smooth close at the end. So maybe, Karen, if you want to start off, um, would you agree with that, that it's something that should be part of the process so that it's not this dramatic event at the end? Right. Well, I definitely feel that way. And one of the things that I always say is closing is a simple executional process of business development well done. So when you have a full pipeline of the right kinds of prospects and you're having the right kinds of meetings, asking the right questions, making sure you're closing up each of those next steps with a date and time, it should move smoothly to that closed sale. It shouldn't be this constant hiccup. Most of the time I find when people have those hiccups and there's a lot of pressure on the close, it's because either they don't have the right people in the pipeline or they don't have enough of a pipeline in order to get smoothly to the close. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Andy? What would you say? <laughs> well, it's hard to argue with any of that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, mean, I think I think the... Maybe the only thing I'd add to that is is why well, it's certainly important to have a full pipeline is is that I think that you know one of the issues that's really uh, overlooked more and more these days in sales, especially in the SaaS business, which tends to focus on top of funnel and closing, if you will, is that really the action takes place in the middle of the funnel. And so, yeah, if you want to be assured of a smooth process to the close, then really being hugely proficient at your discovery, your qualification, and things that take right. place there. That's really the key, right? Because you can look at any deal, or at least I, I can, just look at any deal that didn't close and say, okay, I can trace it back to discovery or qualification, where that's where you get rid of the misfits that don't fit in your profile that shouldn't be selling to. So, yeah, I think we're all in agreement on, on sort of it's part of your process. Yeah. Um, and, and so, Mark, uh, would you agree as well? I mean, it's... It, a lot of it has to do with how you execute the process and that you know, where you have closing issues. Yes, you'll always have issues sometimes that are beyond your control, but a lot of them you can trace to back to earlier, right? Uh, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer in always be advancing. Um, hmm. if, you, if you take a look at our sales process from the customer side, they're trying to make a buying process. And the close 
is really the end of their beginning. And so during what we think of as our sales process, they're trying to first develop a reason to change, uh, build their own internal case for change. And so getting them to that is the necessary part of the close at that stage in their buying process and getting them to understand your, comp your comparative advantages versus somebody else's is another thing that you're going to help them do at a different part. So um, I'm, I, if you look at it from a customer's standpoint, um, always be closing really means always be advancing and helping that customer adding value to each part of their buying process. Which I think raises an interesting point is, you know, too often now you still see in job descriptions that especially, again, oftentimes in SaaS companies where, you know, I'm trying to hire a closer. And so when you listen to, you know, the conversation with Karen and Mark about what closing really entails, as I've always contended, you know, closing is a myth, right? Is whatever this, this mythical functionality and skills this person is supposed to have, yet they don't exist in the real world. I mean, I sold high-end stuff, you know, multi-million dollar systems for a long time. And as I tell people, over selling hundreds of millions of dollars worth of, of products, I was never in the room once when the customer made the decision. Mm. But to Mark's point, always be advancing. Yeah, we, <laughs> we were in lockstep on the process and what the end results are going to be and the commitments had to be in place to make it happen. But closing, yeah, sort of a myth. Yeah, it's an interesting point. And, and uh, so maybe that's a good lead into... So what are some of the mistakes people make, uh, given, as you say, I mean, closing, um, you know, maybe a myth, it's just part of the process, or it's something that should be happening all along. But what are some typical mistakes, Karen, maybe you see that people make when they perhaps actually focus on closing as a strategy in itself? Well, if they focus solely on closing, and, and I would have to say that a lot of the sales leaders will set up their people's commissions that way because mm -hmm. they only get their money and they only get the recognition and they only get to keep their jobs if they actually are closing, but that doesn't put the focus on the beginning. I mean, of course, as door opener, I have to be fighting for let's, let's start talking to the right people. And if there is a mistake that's going on out there is that too few people are talking to the exact right person to begin with. Not enough time is spent on the strategy of getting in the door with these right people. I see a lot of uh, ready, fire, aim, as opposed to ready, aim, fire, making sure that these conversations are happening the right way. So I would say from an efficiency standpoint, that is a mistake that people make is that they're spending so much time closing the wrong sales that they don't spend time focusing on the right ones and making sure that they're getting in the door with those right people yeah and what about you mark how would you uh, what would you say to that well we we hear from researchers and and gurus that um no decision or status quo or do nothing is winning more and more of our opportunities and that's it it's not buyers when they're buying don't say first am i going to do anything and then once i've decided i'm going to do something which which thing am i going to do that do nothing, that status quo is always a dark horse in the background waiting to pounce. Mm -hmm. And if the buying decision doesn't become compelling to do any one thing, the natural human bias towards the status quo is going to say, what we're doing kind of stinks right now, but not as bad as making a decision. So let's just keep struggling <laughs> along. Yeah. So if you haven't built a case for change early, status quo sticks around. If you don't build a case for the superiority of your option over status quo, status quo sticks around. And so if you don't pay attention to what the customer is really thinking and trying to do, uh, when it's time to deliver one of your closes, it's too late. You're trying to close a dead man walking. <laughs> yeah. And let's face it. I mean, it's, it's, you know, people are decision averse in many ways, and I think it became even more acute since the, uh, you know, since the last recession or whatever in two thousand eight. It's, I think, you know, people are so uh, averse to making decisions, are so worried about making the wrong decisions, and I think sometimes, you know, we overlook that in the buyer. We overlook the pressure that making a B two B purchase it can be career enhancing or it can be career limiting depending depending on the outcome of that purchase so you know creating that you know creating the value and helping uh 
uh, make that decision and that urgency early on is critical because there's always going to be that moment when they go, hmm, you know, maybe I should stick with this. Um, what about you, Andy? What, what kind of uh, uh, mistakes do you see that people make towards the closing, the mythical closing phase? Well, I think a lot of it uh, aligned with what Mark talked about is, is yeah, I've, I've experienced in my career and through working with, with companies, is, and there's been some research on this, is that, yeah, people make this decision to change sort of in two steps, right? Are we going to make a change? And if so, who are we going to make it with? And Paul Nutt from Ohio State's written about this quite a bit. And the thing is, that's the business case point, right? Are we going to make a change or not? If the customer hasn't got that point, where there's some sort of agreement internally about what the vision of the outcome is we're trying to achieve and some consensus or at least around, yeah, we think this makes business sense based on what we know so far. Anything beyond that point, if you're spending time and they haven't reached that decision, in my book, they're not qualified and you're going to end up at that no decision point. So you really have to front load the value, I talk about it, uh, to get the people to that point as quickly as you can. Um, yeah, and uh, and so what would you say, Karen, about that as well? Because that brings you back to your early stage door opening piece, right? Right. Well, I think that there are, there are a lot of problems that people will recognize as problems. There are a lot of needs people will recognize as needs. But there are only certain problems and certain needs that people will spend time and money to solve. So one of the things that we try to help our clients do up front when they're deciding who to talk to in the first place is segment only those who will spend time and money to solve a problem. Because then you will be able to advance further and not get stuck uh, in as many of those no decisions or needing to establish value later on with somebody. You know, we, we find that a lot of people are trying to establish value later on a problem that people, the prospect is not going to spend time and money to solve. Yeah, and, and Mark, uh, and maybe put, throw this over to you. Um, how much of this fault lies also with, um, you know, sales management, as I said, who, who often, um, you know, really want to focus on the end, uh, the, the latter stages of the process. They like to come in as the super closers or parachute in and put all their focus there and then not enough focus on helping in the qualification stages. Boy, uh, I was just starting to write something about this in in one of my (laughs) upcoming blog posts is that we uh, are trying to accelerate sales cycles and trying to make it go faster. But the only opportunity you have to add value is probably the first half, maybe the first 60% of the customer's buying process. After that, they know you're doing some cheesy attempt to try to increase prices. So you (laughs) cannot build value at the end right when they are starting to ask for discounts. They are starting to look at the value of their solution versus the price. So the time has passed. And so if we rush through our sales process, especially those first half, two thirds of it, and don't and haven't built value and haven't built a strong case for change, um, the outcome is predetermined in the last one third, and it's not a pretty one. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. And what about that, Andy, uh, on that same topic? How how much responsibility do you think lies with with sales management? Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Was this for me or? No, this is for Andy. (laughs) We'll come back. Um, A lot, I think, is is the answer, right? I mean, so again, I take certain industries, especially those driven more by inside sales. And, yeah, one of the, the prime culprits is this whole idea of a pipeline coverage ratio, which is endemic to sales organizations these days. And so, hey, you know, all you sellers need to have five times, you know, 5x pipeline coverage. And what, you know, sales managers don't seem to understand is that, well, that means your win rates could be the inverse of that, right? Or the reciprocal of that, just by definition. And so what you're doing is creating a scenario where it's impossible for your sellers to work appropriately, work the deals. And so you got this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy where you get a lot of no decisions and you got a, a low win rate. And mm-hmm. so I said, this is really endemic through, certainly through SaaS sales and through other industries now. And that starts with senior management flowing its way down to the frontline sales manager. Right. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned that because I, I, I used to call that the, uh, the feel-good funnel. 
it's like you know where you can look at your you can look at your pipeline and see all of these early stage opportunities and you can say to yourself well right now business may you know may not be going very well but look what it's going to be in 6 months it's going to be fantastic <laughs> right because look at all that of course when you put the when you go forward 6 months you're okay so things aren't great right now but look at the funnel look what it's going to be like in another 6 months and <laughs> because all of it is dropped but that feels good to people and to your point is it's it's very difficult to get people to do rational uh, pipeline um, and and funnel management because it in, it more often than not inevitably means it's going to look a lot lighter than you would like it to do. <laughs> well, just to follow quickly, is is the technology has really mm-hmm. per- perverted the whole process, right? Because <laughs> you know because because we have this ability to you know automate so much of the top of the funnel activities, we do. Right. And which is, yeah, lots of times there's things in life that just because we can do them, we shouldn't. Right. And, but unfortunately, it's one of the cases where we do. So, you know, in my way of thinking and in my experiences, we spend way too much time and effort on top of funnel activities and not near enough where the selling actually takes place in the middle of the funnel. And, you know, this all flows through to, to closing and win rates. And, mm-hmm. you know, there are companies certainly in, in tech space that can be, you know, unicorns and will grow because they've hit the right moment with the right product for, for most of them trying to execute this process. At the end of the day, it's not sustainable the way they're doing it. Yeah. And so this whole predictable revenue model needs to evolve and needs to evolve quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I agree. And I'll, I'll see you and raise you one <laughs> I've talked to uh, several salespeople who've, who've said, well, what the vice president of sales said, we needed a five times coverage. Um, I just entered a whole bunch of manager repellent into yeah. the funnel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And manager now repellent. Everybody in my entire organization has got a touch track screen do something yep. with and suck resources into deals that were simply manager repellent to begin with. And that's well, and companies good. and companies are addicted to this. I mean, I've had conversations with CROs, John's counterparts at, at uh, bigger SaaS companies than, than Pipeliner and said, well, what's your growth strategy? And it's all about top of funnel, hiring more SDRs and just putting more crap into the pipeline. And so what's happened in, in my my belief is that for large segments of the, the sales population that's operating in that model is they're not selling anymore. They're just playing the odds. Mm-hmm. And that's problematic. Yeah, yeah well, the and same the, is true of the, a lot of the automation that feeds the top of funnel. Because from my perspective, people are desperate to not have to have a conversation with actually anyone and not mm-hmm. develop a relationship with mm-hmm. anyone to the point where by the time it gets to the middle of the funnel, it deserves to be in the middle of the funnel. Right. And, you know, that there is that gully between marketing and the beginning of sales. But the point is that if those definitions aren't uh, identified, early on and policed, then you have a funnel that's full of, as you say, crap that, that is fostered by the automation and the fact that the, the SDRs are not in a position to identify the exact right people who are interested in learning more right? And yeah. have those conversations. It's actually very interesting because like five years ago when I saw, you know, a lot of that, the new sales automation coming on I'm, and we do door opening and I'm thinking, oh, well, what's that going to do to us? Well, you know, I thank it very much because it's made the actual relationship even more important and now exactly. people recognize it. But well, not a lot of people, people, people don't, rep- I would say people don't recognize it yet, but Hopefully yeah, well, will. then it's coming. Good for me, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Good for our business. But, you know, for those who do, they're coming back and they're saying this relationship, the conversation is so important. And yet the sellers out there are not trained to have these conversations at top of funnel to bring the right prospects into the funnel warm and ready. And, you know, that's, that's what we preach all the time. Well, I think you raised a really interesting point about the relationship, though, too, which is so critical because mm-hmm. as it relates to closing is that, you know, with the automated top of funnel activities that happen is that, you know, <laughs> a lot of times sellers think, well, and you see this now, relationships, oh, it's not really important, right? <laughs> right. Relationships are really not important. What You know, what I really want is respect. But um, <laughs> set aside that for a separate conversation. But <laughs> but but the, the thing is, is that they don't understand if they don't have the relationship, you know, they can't get the information they want out of the prospect and discovery or any of the subsequent stages. You know, I, I use the analogy. It's like, going on a date with somebody you met on on Tinder or something like that, you know, you don't 
reveal you're crazy on the first date, right? I mean, <laughs> you have to you have to build a you have to build a relationship. <laughs> and the same is true with your prospects. So if there's no relationship, you're not going to get the in-depth information you want about what they're really trying to achieve, what the outcomes are they really desire, because right. they don't trust you. They don't haven't built that bond and rapport. Right. Yeah, and and to be honest, though, we we are um, we are building, or if you like, we are creating a generation of of salespeople that if if they don't get a a hot inbound lead that has all the contact information and the person is basically written, yes, I'm willing to buy, then they'll reach out to them. But they've been with a lot of you know marketing automation and inbound, they've been spoiled where it's like, no, no, I, I don't do, I don't do that building part, I don't do that discovery part or whatever. Like, I just wait for it to land on my plate. That's right, yeah. and and yeah. sales leaders are encouraging that behavior, yeah. and you know, yeah, uh, to to the detriment of building their relationships. It's not valued, uh, sadly, but from if we flip the coin and we take a look at it from the prospect's perspective, that is what they value. If you mm-hmm. ask them, they value that. And you know, you're not going to hit a home run without getting to first base often, and you really need to, to develop that conversation. Well, yeah, because if you don't have the relationship, right, then everything becomes... Um, swappable, right? And the thing is, right. reality, regardless of what people you know want to think, once upon the once upon a time, especially with technology, there was oh switching costs and it's really difficult and nobody wants to. That is tending to go away now, yeah. and I've seen this where people are not as averse to switching their their technologies anymore because it's become a lot easier. But then. If that's the case, then there's a, there's two parts. But obviously, you want to have a good product. But second part, you want to have a good relationship too. That's right. So yeah. So what are some strategies that you would advise? Maybe Mark, we we'll start with you. What some strategies that you would advise salespeople to adopt um, that can uh, really help with this process and make sure that they get smoother closes at the end. I'm kind of radical in this. I look at old <laughs> school, understand your customer better than they understand themselves. Uh, in the last 40 years, I've watched companies subdivide big organizations into smaller organizations, into smaller and smaller silos, into soda straws. And one soda straw owns the budget for what you're buying, but the value of what you sell applies to many silos. And as a seller, your responsibility is to bring those people who don't talk to each other anymore back into the same room and understand a big value picture. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you don't do that, then you're only selling a tiny sliver of the value, which means you're going to get ground on price as you deserve to be. Um, so go back to the beginning and understand the customer's problem, under, which means understanding their business at least as well as they do probably better than a lot of the departmental functionaries that you're going to be talking with to. Right. So that's, uh, and so I think the business acumen part is really incredibly important now. And I think also like the ability, because you've got it at your fingertips, your ability to research. So you can find out a lot mm-hmm. of information, you can educate yourself. So you should be able to have an an informed and intelligent conversation. Um, how about you, Andy? What are, what are some strategies that you would recommend? Well, I, mean, I follow up what Mark said. I think the one thing, the perspective that, if you look at the, if we take Gartner Research as mm-hmm. you know, sort of given, they said, you know, increasing number of stakeholders involved in a decision. If you look last year, they put out their chart about, you know, the buyer enablement and what they call their spaghetti chart about how buying process actually works. And the fact that you have this huge complex diagram and sales is mentioned once in the lower right hand corner um yeah your job to mark's point is and to gartner's point is they don't know how to buy right mm-hmm. and so your job is really i think one you need to look at more of one is collaboration right it's instead of this is not something we're doing to someone selling which is sort of the old perspective right this is something we do with people and we do with multiple people and we're sort of the project leader on this and so this idea of being able to collaborate with multiple different people in moving a project forward and always be advancing, as Mark talked about, is really essential. And that's a skill that we don't train people in. And it gets mm. back to the point Karen made before about relationships is because we can't collaborate with anybody if we don't first build the relationships with them. And yeah, horrified, I you know, LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago to somebody writing this post about 
you know, you need to be liked by your prospects and get all these young sellers writing and saying, oh, no, we just need, need respect. We don't need to be liked. And it's like, well, maybe you don't need the personal validation of being liked, but in order to do your job, people need to like you, mm-hmm. <laughs> especially in a collaborative environment. And so, or you at least need to be likable, right? So I think this collaboration skill is one that increasingly is one that, that we need to be able to teach people. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's it, it's very interesting, and and the other part is right. So people always throw out this thing about you know buyers have so much more information than they ever did. Okay, so that's a given. We all know that. That doesn't mean that makes them any smarter in making decisions. Let's face it. Like if I'm making a buying decision, I've got tons of information at my fingertips, but that information can actually be paralyzing and overwhelming mm-hmm. as opposed to you know as opposed to helpful. So. I, I really need somebody to come and help me to distill this and really get to the meat of it and how it can any help me. And that's the role of the salesperson. So, so Karen, what, uh, what strategies do you suggest to salespeople? Well, the, I mean, the other, the other strategies were wonderful. I totally agree with that. What I would add to that is just remember, your, your prospects are people. They're mm-hmm. just people. They go to work for a reason. And it's not to take your call and it's not just to buy from you. They, they are there for themselves. I mean, years ago, if you said, I can save your company five or 10%, that might have moved the needle. Now it doesn't matter because nobody's going to spend that kind of time investing in, in a change that's that small for them as a person. Like, what does it do for, for those people as people. And I think that's with with all the talk about the personas and marketing's developing personas and I'm not saying we shouldn't have them. Yes, they're they're very helpful, but I think that this individual sellers sometimes forget that the people who are their prospects and who are the influencers and who are the decision makers have fled flesh and blood and that they're individuals and they really need to talk to them as individuals. And don't be discouraged if somebody doesn't lay a hundred thousand dollars at your feet the first day you meet them. You know, they they really need to understand what the value is and they may need a couple more touch points before they're ready to move along and that's okay. It's gotta be okay. If the seller goes into it with that kind of curiosity and willingness to help, it will go much further in terms of them closing more. Mm-hmm. So here's, a, here's an interesting one uh, that I want to pose to, to all of you is uh, that technology, as we know, has changed a lot of things, but it's also allowed a lot of the buying and selling process to be done in a very hands-off way, in a very, you know, at an arm's length way so how do you ensure that you don't that the relationship or establishing a relationship doesn't get lost or 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 inhibited by the fact that uh technology may be between you and and the buyer and the buyer may want that technology in front of them they may they may be more than happy to do things virtually so how do you develop a relationship in that in that scenario Uh, maybe mark um Customers don't buy our products or services. They buy their own outcomes. And if you can talk to them about their outcomes, the technology you're using to get through, uh, you build credibility and you build value regardless of the medium or the channel. And if you don't do that, if you don't talk to them about their outcomes, now you're trying to sell them your thing. And that's never going to go anywhere regardless of what technology, whatever technology. Uh, Technology is kind of that curse that prevents us from focusing on that, but is the tool that if we wanted to start learning about their outcomes, it's, it's there for the taking if we wanted it to do, to do that and develop the habits to go out and try to figure that out. Here's here's just an interesting point before we move on, but here's an interesting one because I've been researching a few things recently, services that, you know, we might be signing up for. And it's really interesting uh, you know, doing the meetings virtually. And it's about 50% of the salespeople who are calling me switch on their camera. Nice. And I'm a little blown away by that because I'm like, I'm doing the meeting through Zoom. I'm mm. giving you the opportunity here, right? My camera's yeah. on, you can see yeah. me. I'm giving you the opportunity. Yeah. Turn on and your yet, freaking camera. Yeah. yeah, and yet 50% of them are not turning it on. I just thought that was an interesting little kind of... Uh, 
little micro research of mine, but well, I, that that kind of blows I mean, me away. Yeah. Well, it does, and it's and it's. I think it's emblematic of a, sort of a larger issue in terms of, and again, not to <laughs> point fingers, <laughs> but at how we're socializing and and training people coming into sales these days. You know, I, I was speaking to a group in New York last year, and and a lot of sort of high end SaaS companies, and I said, okay, well, you know, who's got a lifetime contract value? Let's say two hundred thousand dollars or more. And, you know, about half the room raised their hand. I said, okay, well, how many of you actually travel to close a deal? None. Yeah. Okay. And it's like, okay. I said, $200,000, you know, the price of a plane ticket. If I were competing against you, I would go out and visit every one of those deals and I would win every single one of them. <laughs> and but Andy, decided- <laughs> I, would, I would ask whether, was it the salesperson's uh, decision Oh, or no, that's saying this is, how this is how they're being trained. Manager, right, who right. said the, you're not allowed to travel. You're so not allowed to, you don't have time, yeah. blah, 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 because you got 5X yeah. pipeline opportunities, you have to coverage, all that stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, but, it, yeah. but at the end of the day, this is how they're being raised. So when they become managers, they'll be thinking the exact same thing. And it's like, to Mark's point is, yeah, I can do some of this stuff virtually, that's great. But if the price point allows it, I'd go on plane every time and go meet somebody because I would dramatically increase the odds of me winning because I am excel accentuate and amplify that relationship in a way you can't do virtually not that you can't do it virtually but you know this is this is i think is sort of generational in the way again we're we're raising this this latest generation of sellers is the more personal you can make it because we've been talking about the value relationships i believe this is you know to as, <laughs> as deeply as you can you have to take the steps to maximize and optimize it mm-hmm. Boy, Andy, yeah. I- and there's and there's going to be just to be one to put in one point but there's also going to be a challenge as as uh, you know, the same generational things become decision makers and buyers. Because we've I've seen a, a few instances recently where people have turned down, the buyer has turned down the opportunity for the seller mm-hmm. to come and visit them and said, no, I want to do everything virtually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, well, that, ex- anyways, that, sorry. That, ex- that exists. But I, I'll say that that's, as those buyers get older, that will change. <laughs> sorry, Mark, you were going to say? No, I, I, um, I was going to say that the video connection. I mean, we're still human beings uh, to mm-hmm. Karen's point. We're human beings. And the huge percentage of how we communicate with each other is body language, tone of voice. And if you don't take advantage of that as a seller, there's a whole bunch of relationship and I'll call it credibility mm-hmm. that you aren't taking the opportunity to build. And so All of the technical things I talked about, about understanding their business and their outcomes goes for naught if they don't believe that you care. Mm -hmm. And the way to show them you care is with your eyes and with your face and with your gestures. Absolutely. And it's important to say also in the same vein is that when you do have a meeting via conference call or especially when video is attached to it, there is a methodology associated with that so that you get the optimal outcome. And that is not being trained uh, as as well as it should be trained for this different uh, for this different point of view, I mean, if you if you've ever seen the video conference call in real life, I mean, it's it's uh, hysterical. Everybody should go on YouTube and check that out. But it really is very true. If you don't have backup technology uh, for when the technology fails, if if uh, you don't have fill in conversation, that's of value for when people are a little late or a dog is barking or uh, whatever it is. You're not going to get to the optimal outcome for the time you're spending prospecting, taking advantage of the valuable real estate that is a prospect's attention. And I think you, you raise a great point there. And I think it's about uh, human, uh, you know, reintroducing or making sure that it may be technology based, but the human element is there. So humanizing right. the, the experience. And, and I absolutely couldn't agree with you more is I think that's a big challenge for organizations and even for organizations that train, uh, you know, sales training organizations because everything uh, used to be based around pretty much it's either, you know, in person or telephone, but not not for virtual, not like this. And I think a lot of people haven't been trained. And I think that's maybe the reason why 50% of those salespeople don't turn on their cameras because they just don't know how to leverage the technology effectively. 
They didn't get dressed after the gym, you know, who knows? Exactly. <laughs> I think, I think Terrence points absolutely right is, is, and this, this place are the a bigger part of the conversation is that, you know, to be successful in sales is, as you can tell from the comments of the people on the panel, it's, it's a deliberate act. You know, you mm-hmm. have to be conscious every step of the way. And yeah, if you've got a meeting or morning full of meetings coming up and you don't build in the time to be dressed uh, other than gym clothes, that, you know, when the calls come, then you're just hurting your own chances. Yeah, and I and I think that's a that's a, a another great point is that uh, people are forgetting that uh, you know these things matter. Yeah, you know, being being polite, being on time, being properly presented, all those things still matter. It doesn't matter whether you're at the end of a camera or in mm-hmm. in front of people. It doesn't give you the it doesn't give you permission to just throw everything out and be completely like casual and you know, kind of haphazard. Yeah. Yeah, it really doesn't take that long at all to put a shirt on <laughs> and stay seated. And I call, the, I call it the conference call mullet, right? It's scissors <laughs> up top and a party down, you know, below <laughs> waist level. <laughs> yeah, ab- absolutely. Okay, in the in the last few minutes here, um, what would be some last pieces of advice would you give to people, particularly as we're heading towards the end of the year? A lot of people are on calendar year uh, quotas. What can they do to ensure that they're, even at this stage, that their opportunities have a have a smoother journey to that close? Um, maybe Andy, do you want to start? <laughs> sure. Well, yeah. I think it. it I'll go back to because I share this this philosophy, I guess, with Mark is that you know if you're very deliberate about assuring that every sales touch is advancing the customer toward making a decision, and that's my definition of value, right? A, a sales call doesn't have value. Sales interaction doesn't have value if there's no progress on the part of the prospect. Mm-hmm. And so it's just being very deliberate about that. So if you have deals you need to close in order to hit your number or hit some sort of goal by the end of the year. You know, if you are with your prospect and you make a plan as to say, look, if we go through these steps, we can close in thus and such time frame, then you have to be very conscious and deliberate about how you work through that to ensure that you're helping them advance every time you interact with them. Great. Fantastic. And uh, Karen? I think for the remainder of the year, if people go back through their open deals and the deals that are in motion through the pipeline right now and put those those people, those prospects through the filter of do these people feel urgency around a conversation and moving forward? Do they find you to be the obvious solution or even better, the only solution? And will they willingly pay what you want to charge for your services and your products? And if they meet those criteria, in addition to the other ones like size of company, level of decision maker, Mm -hmm. and all the other ones that are good, uh, then spend your time there, but be really choosy from an efficiency standpoint, whether you're spending time with people who will advance, because if, if you're not, then you, you may not be spending the right amount of time with the right people and therefore cost yourself the ability to close as much as you could. Yeah. Fantastic. And Mark? Slow is fast. (laughs) Slow down, but speed up. Don't rush to get that prospect to the next stage that your CRM has identified in their buying process. Fill this stage and this part of their buying cycle with as much value as you can shove into their brains, then promote them. And you do that and actually things will speed up, but stop trying to get them to the next stage. Start diving deep into the stage you're in and adding value every single time. Yeah, I, I, that's a, that's a great that's a great point, Mark, and that's uh, you know why we built in in our CRM and even in our own sales process is that it's important. Yes, having your defined sales stages are important, but as important is what happens within the stage itself. And as you say, if you haven't properly qualified, if you haven't asked the right questions, if you haven't got the right information, you should not be thinking about the next stage you should be thinking about how do i complete where i am today all right good so in the last in the last moment here i'd just like you all to again remind people how they can find out more about you uh karen 
They can go to my website, which is copconsultingusa.com, K-O-P-P consultingusa.com to learn more about me, about the door opener service, about the moment of yes messaging. And there's also on my blog years worth of tips that would be helpful with regard to efficiency. Excellent. And Andy? Yeah, you can find me at thesaleshouse.com. Uh, Andy at thesaleshouse.com. If you email me, track me down on LinkedIn. And uh, well, listen to my podcast, Accelerate. Only 724 episodes. So, <laughs> oh, great. So, so that's uh, well, there's a, there's, there's, um, what's it, Labor Day weekend coming up. So, you've got three days to listen to them the all people. Could, people could listen to yeah, all of them. They yeah. probably get through it. <laughs> and, Mark, uh, I'm at Boundy Consulting. Boundy is B O U N D Y, almost like the paper towels. Consulting.com. <laughs> Um, or you can reach out to me, Mark Boundy, on LinkedIn. Um, read could, read any of my posts. Um, pin me for my upcoming book on selling to complete value, to full value. Um, Excellent. Or reach out. All right. Listen, thanks, everybody. Thanks, uh, Mark, Andy, and Karen. It's been a fantastic panel. Thank you for those who attended. Uh, and also for those who will listen to the recording, I think there's a lot of great stuff in here. And I hope you have a fantastic end to your year if you're on your calendar year. And I hope some of the uh, advice and information you got today is going to help you reach your number and uh, maybe even hit your accelerators. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> all right. So thanks, everybody. I'll see you all again for another uh, panel discussion really soon. Thank you, John. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.